Welcome back for chapel. I'd like to begin our chapel time this morning in uh, reading from Psalm 40. The first uh, five verses of Psalm 40. David says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire, and he set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Uh, in front of you is a hymnal. Uh, it should be an university hymnal in the back. It's in the it's either underneath your chair or on the little rack in front of you. Uh, turn to number 60. You'll have the lyrics for the solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less. We'll sing it slightly different with the rhythm, but the same lyrics that are in there. So please stand. <laughs> Experienced pastors, uh, what's wrong with this picture? Daniel's in the lion's den. You've seen the paintings. Young man, long flowing hair, ruddy cheeks, looking up to heaven, the lions behind him, mouths muzzled by the Spirit of God. Beautiful picture. What's wrong with this picture? Daniel is about 90 years old by this point. That's what's wrong with this picture which says that no matter what phase of ministry the Lord calls you, the lions can still be there. What does God give us as hope in such a situation? You know the story? Moved by jealousy, Daniel is set up by the other governors and leaders of Babylon, and so a king signs the law of the Medes and the Persians, saying that if anyone praise to any god but Darius, he will be thrown to the lions. Verse 10, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, 
He went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel, and he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and the Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Well, you know where the story goes, but let's read the end. You know the mouths of the lions were shut. Verse 25. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God enduring forever, and his kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions, so this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So the lions roared, in the life of the translator of Ravi Zacharias after Ravi had left the Crusades in Vietnam. Upset by the success of the Crusades, by the conversions of the Vietnamese, the government took the translator of Ravi Zacharias and put him in a concentration camp for retraining. Ravi wrote later, he did not hear for seven years from that translator because for seven years, through daily beatings and deprivations, the translator was receiving one message from his captors, there is no God. But for seven years, the one who had seen the conversions, the one who had memorized scripture, continued every morning in daily prayer and meditation upon the word of God that he had hidden in his heart. Until the seventh morning anniversary when there was another beating, another very clear message, there is no God. And that day the translator did not pray and he did not meditate on the Word of God. He was assigned on that day to mucking out the latrine. And as he was mucking out the latrine on that day that he had abandoned his God, he saw a scrap of paper with English print on it. He picked it up and hid it away in his clothes, reading it at night of that same day. And the words that he read were these. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord.
And on the seventh year anniversary of his incarceration, on the day that he had abandoned his God, he learned that his God had not abandoned him. Through the providence of God, the commandant continued to use the pages of the New Testament for his morning toilet. And so day after day, the word of God came to the translator to give him fresh hope and courage and understanding of the reality of the presence of God, even in the awful circumstances of his life. When you hear that, we are inspired, we are moved, it is beautiful, it is awful, it is everything at the same time. But it is reminding us, of course, that, that the message that our hearts want to believe, that when we face difficulty that God is gone, is not true. That God is still present, he is still working, even after what may seem to be years of deprivation. It's, it's certainly what is happening in Daniel's life as he faces difficulty but believes that there is still a calling. It's, it's the same thing you and I are to experience when we are in pastoral situations, when we are just believers facing the difficulties of family, of life, of career. We are called to a faith beyond the world that we can see. I mean, if you just say, what's the world that Daniel sees? He sees 90 years of faithfulness to God about to go up in smoke, or if you will, down a lion's gully. He sees his people in captivity for 70 years. And if you know the prophecies of Daniel, he believes that there is much trouble yet to come. I mean, surely Daniel has to reason, what is the use of this? What is the sense in my faithfulness? And of course, his example is helping us to remember that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For what he can see is clearly not evidence of God. If he only were to read his circumstance, but somehow he is seeing beyond his world in faithfulness. And what he sees is so obvious to us, we read right past it, is in verse 10. Do you remember right at the beginning? When Daniel knew the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Well, not because it's Mecca and not because it's magic. Because he knows it is the place that the promises of God will be fulfilled. He does not see it. He does not know how it will happen. He does not know when it will happen. But he has the word of his God who has said that there is a, a destination for the people, there is deliverance for the people, and it will happen by whatever happens in that place of Jerusalem. He believes in the promises of God. And somehow he has some measure of reason to believe in those promises because of the presence of God that's already been operative in his life. We're in the sixth chapter. You know this is the end of the biographical chapters. But you recognize the... The presence of God has been witnessed before through saving some young men who ate vegetable soup. <laughs> through God's giving him insight into dreams. God's delivering friends from a fiery furnace. God somehow preserving him against a king who would even take the vessels from the temple of God and brag that there was no God of Daniel. Over and over, God has, see Daniel, has seen God working as as though God is saying, it is hard, it is tough, it is awful, but remember, I'm the God of your salvation as well as the God of promise. And for that reason, trust me, I'm still working even when you cannot see it. You've seen my presence. You know my promise. I'm still working. The translator in the concentration camp was revitalized enough by the scriptures that he did take new hope. And with a few other of the prisoners began to plan their escape by renovating a broken down boat that they had found. Through whatever happens in the life of a concentration camp, there was betrayal. And so the word got out to the guards that there was this boat being repaired and four armed guards came to the translator one morning saying, are you trying to escape? Oh, no, he said, no. What would give you that idea? I'm not trying to escape. And they let him alone. But then it began to play on his mind. Had he been delivered by a lie, 
Now, you and I can debate the ethics of this another time. <laughs> you know, can you lie to the Nazis when they say, where are the orphans? You know, we'll save that for the ethics class. But at least in his own mind, he believed that not only had he been saved by a lie, but his testimony of his God had been compromised by the lie. And so a few days later, the guards returned. Are you planning an escape? Yes. Good, we want to go with you. <laughs> and that was the escape. So that seven years from the time of his incarceration, he called Ravi Zachariah and said, I'm free. God has delivered. I think we can look just at, you know, the Sunday school versions of Daniel's life or just the, the fantastic accounts of the uncommon heroes that we tell stories of. And we wonder, is that real? I mean, to, to actually believe that God is still working, that he calls us to faithfulness in the difficulty, we can clearly see because we are going to trust his presence and his promises beyond what's happening in my life. It's not just something pastors will wrestle with. I, I read, as some of you may have read recently, the surveys that were done at Uniroyal, the rubber tire company, and Pitney Bowes, the packaging company. And managers were surveyed, and the results were this. Of the 800 managers between these cooperative companies that were surveyed, 60% of those at Pitney Bowes and 70% of those at Uniroyal said they had to compromise their integrity in order to have success and promotion in their jobs. 60% at Pitney Bowes, 70% at Uniroyal had to compromise their integrity in order to maintain their jobs and their futures. And only because I'm in academics, those numbers rang a bell because of what some of us in academics know to be the famous Rutgers and Stanford studies. At Rutgers, 60% of undergraduates saying that they cheated in order to have success in college. At Stanford, the cream of the cream, 70% saying that they cheated in order to maintain. And, you know, we just have to look across. I mean, I've been in academics a long time, even academics for religious training people. And I know how easy it is to think success requires I compromise for the moment. God will forgive me, and he'll take care of this later. You, you recognize all our people, including all of us, are struggling. And for us to say, listen, I know that the present circumstance, the present difficulty seems to say that God is absent, but, but your heart is set on the reality of a God who has saved you, who sent his son to pardon you. If you know of that work, if his presence by his spirit is in your heart, and you know the promises of the one who is to come, to, to trust him in the moment, to have faith beyond the world that you see is still the calling, not just of our people, it's our calling too. Because we feel the pressures over and over again, I know it and you know it, to, to turn the truth just a little bit, to not say just enough, to, to just stay safe. And Daniel simply was teaching us, no, I'm called to faith beyond the world that we see, which may mean faithfulness through a world of suffering. The path of faithfulness we forget because we just want to tell the nice Sunday school sanitized stories is sometimes a path through suffering. Daniel's count, after all, was recognized this, 90 years of faithfulness. I'm not a, an Old Testament expert, but those who study Daniel say, of the 90 years, if you look actually at the historical accounts in Daniel, we actually have insight into only nine days. So nine days of Daniel's recorded life, of the 90 years that he expanded. And here were the challenges Early, middle, late, the challenges just keep coming. And here he is at the end of his life, 90 years, and here's another day that he ha seemingly has the greatest challenge yet. I mean, you kind of think, those of us who are pastors, I'll get to a certain point, I'll have it figured out. You know, I'll get to a certain point, the troubles will be behind me. I'll kind of know how to manage this thing of church and pastorate and so forth. And yet I would just tell you my own experience is most of my friends, their greatest challenges happen at the greatest maturity in their ministries. As though God is taking years of deprivation as the training for the greater trials 
of faithfulness to, to which he calls us. And, and, and we don't like thinking that way. We want to think that what God would do, if God were really smart, you know, he'd provide a lot of abundance that would get you ready for the trial of affliction and deprivation. We, we, we expect there to be, you know, the, the harvest before winter. But it's often not the way it happens in the scriptures. Often there are years of deprivation that create dependence that is necessary for the deeper devotion. And we don't like thinking that way. Moses, right? So 40 years in the desert after Pharaoh's court before he goes back, and then it's going to be 40 more years before he goes into the promised land or actually doesn't. Long years of deprivation. The Apostle Paul, 13 years from the time of the Damascus Road experience to that first mission trip. 13 years of obscurity and training, ways we don't even fully understand. Somehow God is in obscurity preparing him. John Bunyan, writer of Pilgrim's Progress, seven years in prison before the first words of Pilgrim's Progress being written. We don't like thinking that way, that, that deprivation sometimes gets us ready for dependence. That is the mark of devotion. But, but it's just the words of the novelist. At the moment of decision, all the deciding has already been done. In the nine days, the 90 years had already prepared. It's true of us. It just won't be that we will face a time in ministry, that there will be no challenge, no difficulty. But when the difficulty comes for us, we have to say, at the time of decision, all the deciding's already been done. And, and that is calling us to, to faithfulness, even through the suffering that we may have to face. I think of missionary friends of mine, Scott and Jennifer Myrie, doctors in Uganda. They could have made a lot of money in the United States if they'd given their careers here, both of them doctors and yet they gave themselves to mission work in Uganda. I would have to tell you, despite the great sacrifice of raising their families in Uganda without much return at all, they also saw not much fruit to their ministry until Ebola. And I heard Scott talk about when he went to his wife, Jennifer, and said, Ebola is not in our part of Africa, but I'm a doctor, I'm in Africa, I know what to do, and I must go. Both of them knowing that he might not return. And after these long years of deprivation of, of family and ministry, now even greater risk, greater call to dependence and devotion at this end of the path. Well, the fact that I tell you the story, you know he survived. But it wasn't until he returned and those around him who knew the sacrifice that he was willing to make for fellow Africans actually began to hear the message like they had never heard before of a Savior who would give himself for the sake of others. The long years of deprivation that created dependence and the readiness for the devotion. What, what does that readiness look like? I know it's just obvious. Here we are in a seminary setting talking to pastors and seminary training, but, but Daniel was just faithful in prayer. I mean, verse 10, he, three times a day, please don't make it magic, you know, how many times a day? The Bible has different numbers of time depending on where you look. But he prayed, did you catch it? Just as he had done before. That this was the pattern and practice of his life to actually seek God in devotion, on his knees, signaling his devotion. It, it doesn't mean that it's, it's magic in itself. Some people are upset when they read the writings of Charles Spurgeon. And he said, you know, I, I hardly ever pray even five minutes or go five minutes without praying. As though there was this conversation with God that was going all the time. Jack Miller, who in his journal wrote, God, forgive me of my habitual tendency to depend upon my own talents. And I know when I talk to preachers, I'm talking to myself when I say that my habitual tendency to trust in my own talents rather than to get on my knees and say, God, help me open a heart, change a people, help this church, not me, Lord. You have to do this. And that 
preparation of dependence and prayer is certainly the mark of Daniel. He's also not just faithful in prayer. He is faithful in practice despite the clocks, two clocks ticking in the life of Daniel. One is the 90-year clock. I've done this a long time, and I don't see much effect of this. And by the way, I can stop being faithful for just 30 days, and it'll all be okay. No risk, just, just put it off for a little bit. And I recognize the temptation for pastors and all the people in church to both. Wait, I've, I've served so long, I've done so well, I've preached so hard, and still, Lord, where's the fruit I'm supposed to see? Or when the trial comes to say, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll just not say it for a bit, not do it for a bit, not do what I have to do, not, not right now, and believe that that is the answer. I mean, Daniel ignores the clocks. He just says, I'm going to be faithful to God no matter what time it is. Despite the lions, he does know the threat. He knows what lions are about. And despite the threat, he says, I'm going to do what's right and trust God to take care of the rest. And that is not just an ancient story. About this time last year, some of you remember the, the beheading of the Syrian Christians who had gone to Aleppo to help. Eleven Christian relief workers from Syria beheaded and hanged outside the village to which they were ministering. One of those was the 12-year-old son of one of the workers. And the leader of the relief agency wrote this later. They kept on praying loudly and sharing Jesus until their last breath. They did this in front of the villagers as a testimony of their faith. Believe me, they knew the time was ticking and they knew the danger of their testimony. But they did what they believed God had called them to do, even through suffering. And it is not, it is not just for a distant place. Again, this time last year, the Oregon shooter at the Umqua Community College campus asked the Christians to stand. Are you a Christian? Stand. Good, you're about to meet your maker. And he shot them. Despite the obstacles, despite the fact that it would seem to make no difference. I mean, to me, some of the hardest words here are the laws of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be changed. But Lord, if I am faithful, if I do what's right, it won't change anything. And God says to us and to our young people who are saying that over and over again to us, it won't make any difference. They won't change the movie. They won't shut down the website. My friends won't believe. They'll only laugh. It won't make any difference. And because it won't make any difference, I have no obligation. But sometimes that's what we think. It will make no difference. So why not just be saved? And God is calling us to faithfulness through the world of suffering by Daniel to a a faith beyond the world we see, a faith through the world of suffering, because ultimately we are being called to be faithful to a world beyond our own. You know these last words and their importance. What does Daniel actually hear after the lion's den? He hears God roar. Through a king that is secular, Daniel hears God say, all peoples are to honor the God of Daniel. Somehow rising above the mess is the work of God. And it's also beyond the moment. He is the God who not only saves Daniel and is to be worshipped by all peoples. Verse 26, he is the God who endures forever. Beyond the mess and beyond the moment, God is still working. I think in my own life of of first church that I pastored, farming community, where there was a man, he was, you have these people you know in your church, kind of the true cornerstones of the, I know Christ is the only cornerstone, but I mean, this was, this was one of those people, you know, you just kind of say, we stand or fall because of this faithful man. A man who in his early adulthood did not get married because his ailing parents needed his help to take care of them and the farm. Married late in life, had children late in life, lived poor all his life. And then the amazing thing, 
the mines discovered the coal on this property. And so they brought the property at this tremendous price. And he took the money, typical of the man, and built quality homes, giving them to his children. And having such quality homes that he wanted to sell to kind of maintain himself and his wife for the rest of their years. But the trouble was, the coal in our community was high sulfur soft coal, which the EPA had basically, within a month of his building those homes, ruled illegal in the United States. Which means that our community's miners were without funds and the young people evaporated from the community and there was nobody to buy his homes. He went broke. And I can remember him walking out of our church one day and just taking my hand the way people do when they leave. And he said to me these words, he said, Brian, I am just a zero. I am nothing. And I, I did not know how to tell him how much he meant to me, a young pastor who had struggled through the hard times to say a man who was faithful and what it meant to me, watch him stand strong. And, and to recognize because of his faithfulness, how in our church, young person after young person began to go into the mission field, began to go into ministry, how I begin to recognize now as I look back, there are thousands of people who have heard the gospel because that man who believed himself a zero was being used by God above the mess of his life and beyond the time of his life to do the work of God. It's true of Daniel. You know the last words here. You know why I hesitate. Not only was he blessed during the time of King Darius, but during the reign of whom? Cyrus the Persian. And you know who that is. The one who would let the people go. Who would go back to Jerusalem. Who would establish the temple again would establish the people again and from whom our Savior would arise in God's time. Daniel would never see it. He would never go back. He would never have the reward. But above the mess and above the moment, God was working. And it is our calling as well to believe it's still true that the God who has shown his presence in our lives and the promise of his coming is still working. As I was growing up, my dad traveled a lot in his career, wanted to be home with, you know, his family, which included one girl and five boys. And that meant that he would often bring his work home to work. Five boys were not going to cooperate with that plan. And I can remember my mom at times kind of rushing into a room and saying, boys, boys, hush now, your father's working. And now I know there are times I need to hear those words again, a different tone. But I need to hear the words too. Your heart is so anxious. You are so afraid, so worried, so hurting. Lord, my heart is crying now. And through the scriptures, hear the voice of God. Your father's working. Please. They put a seal on Daniel's tomb and rolled the stone over it until the morning came when they broke the seal and rolled the stone away and Daniel came out. They will break another seal and roll away another stone. And our Savior did come out. You know that. Above the mess and beyond all time, God was working. So when our hearts cry out, listen to his voice. It's not the roar. It's still and it's quiet. Shh. Your father's working. Father, so teach us your word. That even we who are professional in the word, who want to relegate even this account to the Sunday school curriculum of the children, might be the children who hear it. Teach us afresh the goodness and the wonder of a God who saves. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.